So today we're going to look at polarity in terms of bonds and polarity in terms of polar entire molecules. And this is talking about molecular or covalently bonded substances. And whether I'm talking about a polar bond or a polar molecule, essentially the electrons are not evenly shared or spread out. They're lopsided. A polar bond has one atom that is more electronegative or attractive to the electrons in the bond. Polar molecules, we're going to have to look at the overall number of polar bonds and the shape. So looking at our type of bonding here, when we're looking at polarity, we're only looking at polar covalent and non-polar covalent bonds. Ionic bonds are not here. Ionic bonding is a different kind of bonding. It's a total transfer of electrons, so I can't think about unevenly sharing things. There's no sharing. In order to determine what type of bond I'm looking at, I have to look at the type of atoms in the bond. So ever since first year, we've said a metal and a non-metal are going to give us an ionic bond. So I have two non-metals, then I'm looking at a covalent bond. And in AP, there's kind of a simple way of looking at it. If the two elements are the same, or if it is a carbon bonded to hydrogen, in AP, you can safely assume that that bond is nonpolar. Is it entirely that simple? Eh, kind of. But for our purposes in first year college chemistry, that will work. So if the elements are the same, or if it is a carbon bonded to hydrogen, we can assume that that is nonpolar bonds. If the elements are different, then it must be at least slightly polar. Again, it's a little more complicated than that in reality land, but for us in first year of college chemistry, this will work. So a polar bond has a difference in electronegativity in the atoms that are sharing. One atom is more electronegative, which means it's more attractive to the electrons in that bond. That's the definition of electronegativity. So you will end up with one atom hanging on to the electrons preferentially over the other. So you end up with a positive side and a negative side. They're not ions. So this is a partial positive and partial negative charge. If it was plus minus, we'd have an ionic compound. Now, if I can scale this up over the entire molecule, if the molecule as a whole has a uneven distribution or a lopsided distribution of electrons, that is then a polar molecule. And a polar molecule has what's called an overall dipole moment. It has to do with the distance and the amount of charge difference, the strength of the partial positive and negative charge. So if I have a molecule which contains lots of very strongly polar bonds, then it will have a larger dipole moment. The unit of the dipole moment is the Debye. You'll see that sometimes in data tables. When Debye is equal to a very small number of Coulombs, Polar covalent bond has a bond dipole. And a bond dipole has an amount and a direction. It is, in fact, always pointing towards the more electronegative atom. So these actually act like a vector. And if you're taking physics, you're going to do a lot with vectors. Um, if not, that's OK. Think about it like a pole, like I have someone pulling on this side of me that's pulling me this direction. So if you kind of think about it like trying to play tug of war, it'll help if you're not all the way up into adding vector math right now. Ordinarily, a polar molecule must have polar bonds. You have to have some bond dipoles. But, notice large capital letters, but, just having polar bonds is not enough to make a polar molecule. You have to look at the overall molecule and the shape and the way 
that those dipoles are pulling on the molecule as a whole. So it is absolutely 100% possible that a molecule can have polar bonds and be nonpolar entirely overall if those bond dipoles cancel. For example, let's say I have someone on this side of me pulling this arm, but then someone pulls this side exactly the same amount. Well, then I end up stuck in the middle. The pull from my left arm balances out the pull from my right arm. The bond dipoles are the same and opposite. So I would be very symmetrical in that circumstance. So to predict molecular polarity, number one, you have to have polar bonds. If you don't have some polar bonds, you have to have a nonpolar molecule. So if you look at your molecule and it's all the same atom, or you look at your molecule and it's all C's and H's, it's a nonpolar molecule. Walk away. There are no bond dipoles. This has to be a nonpolar molecule. Once I find that I do have a polar bond, I'm going to have to draw the Lewis structure and then use the Bessifer method to predict the molecular shape. From that 3D molecular shape, I'm going to determine does this pull have a downward pull to cancel it out? Or is this pulling up and there's nothing on the opposite side to help cancel it out? So I'm going to look at those bond vectors, kind of add them together in my head and decide if they're going to cancel each other out. If they cancel each other out, I get a nonpolar molecule. If they don't, I have a polar molecule. Notice that lone pair electrons on that center atom. You have to keep them in mind when you're doing the Vesiper method. That also is something you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about dipole moments because that is negative charge. So let's look at these two molecules and decide what we think of them. Here are the, the three-dimensional structures here of trichloromethane and tetrachloromethane. And I think you can kind of see that in this three-dimensional tetrahedral structure, all of these angles are the same. They're all 109.5 on these sp3 hybridized carbons. And so, of course, this is absolutely a polar bond. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. I would have a bond dipole on these bonds and there'd be a bond dipole going out each time, pointing out towards these chlorines. But if I look at it, when I have these dipoles, I kind of end up with them all going out in equal opposite directions. There's a bond going up in the plane at 109 degrees, but that basically gets canceled out by the other bond in the plane, which is going out at 109 degrees the opposite way. Then I have one going back from the plane at 109 degrees and one going straight forward from the plane at 109 degrees, and those are opposite to equal. So this turns out to be a nonpolar molecule, even though it has a ton of polar bonds in it. Now, this has three polar bonds and one nonpolar bond. So this is nonpolar here. It has no bond dipole. So if I want to look at how these cancel out again, I can think about Hey, one's going back exactly 109 degrees. One's equally going forward at 109 degrees. But here I have one going down in the plane and nothing to cancel it out going up. So in fact, overall, I have a net molecular dipole here. And this is in fact a polar 
molecule with a partial negative charge on the chloramines and a partial positive up here towards the hydrogen, where the overall symmetry here makes carbon tetrachloride a nonpolar molecule. So if I look at CO2, CO2 again has absolutely polar bonds. One's going straight out to the left, one's going straight out to the right. The bond angle here is 180 degrees because this is an sp hybridized carbon in the middle. And so overall, it has, it has no dipole at all. However, if I had this molecule, which would be very, very similar in shape, where instead of having two oxygens, I have a car an oxygen and a sulfur, this actually is a polar molecule because I would have a fairly large bond dipole going out to the carbon and a smaller bond dipole going towards the sulfur because sulfur is less electronegative than oxygen. So it'd be like I have a big guy pulling on this side and a little kid pulling over here. I'm going to be shifted towards that big guy pulling. Water is a polar molecule. It is a polar molecule because it is bent. And so I have two bond dipoles going from the H to the O because O is extremely electronegative. And so it's almost like a tent. I have these two bond dipoles pointing up towards that O which hold each other up and keep the net dipole going up. So water is a very polar molecule. So a key thing to think about here, Lewis structures lie to you about polarity because Lewis dot diagrams are 2D representations on a flat piece of paper. Lewis dot diagrams are not the 3D shape of any molecule other than a linear molecule, really, you have to think about the vesifer shape, the three-dimensional shape. That's why I hate, hate, hate this diagram for water. I hate it so much. It's technically correct. It has two bonds. It has two lone pairs. But especially in first year chem, I don't know how many people tell me this is perfectly symmetrical, so water is nonpolar, and then I'm tearing my hair out. Because this is not perfectly symmetrical. Water is bent because it has four electron centers. And so Lewis dot diagrams will lie to you. You have to think about the three dimensional structure. I don't know how many times. I have people telling me the bond angle is 180 degrees. Ah, no, it's 104 because it's bent. So you can't look at a Lewis structure on the page and determine the polarity. You have to think about the 3D. And we will practice drawing more Lewis structures, looking at more complicated shapes and dipole overall dipole moments a lot. In class, because determining whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar is going to be really important for determining the types and kinds of intermolecular forces that we see between molecules.